Well, welcome to the Open Source Summit Day 2. Uh, my name is Tom Watson. Uh, today I'm going to be uh, talking about lightning fast Java application startup. And in particular, I'm going to be using a technology called uh, Checkpoint and Restore uh, with the CRAU project, along with uh, Eclipse Open J9 for my JVM. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I uh, live and work here in Austin, Texas at IBM. I've been involved with open source for uh, nearly 20 years, starting with the original uh, Eclipse project before the uh, Eclipse Foundation was even started. And I was involved with uh, getting the platform moved over to an OSGI-based uh, runtime for modularity. And that's where the, the Equinox project started. I'm also involved with the Apache Felix project, which is a also implements various uh, OSGI specification implementations. And then uh, my primary focus nowadays is a project called Open Liberty. And this is an IBM open source project uh, that we host at GitHub. Um, and it, it uh, has our implementations of Jakarta EE and uh, MicroProfile, as well as the uh, previous versions of Java EE. Um, I'm also involved in a few open specifications at uh, Eclipse. Uh, the OSGI working group, I have a long history with OSGI, so I was involved with the OSGI Alliance before it moved over into uh, Eclipse for doing uh, specification uh, work there, and now I'm also getting involved in the Jakarta working group. So first I thought I'd go into a little bit of motivation on why uh, we're looking into fast startup for Java applications, and in particular for uh, MicroProfile and Jakarta EE applications. So uh, today when you're deploying things uh, to the cloud, oftentimes uh, you're using containers, you're containerizing your application. And this just basically provides that environment for running your programs, but allows for it to uh, have isolation between you know, processes from one container to the next. And oftentimes you have um, a short lifespan for these containers. They're not... Uh, like the typical uh, Jakarta EE platform or Java EE platform from the past, they were long-running servers that you deployed your application to. Uh, now with the containerized applications, you basically bundle all that you need uh, together within that container, and then you have to start, start it all up to serve your, pro uh, serve your application. So when we're talking about something like a web service uh, that's implemented in Java, uh, it still uh, will want to use some of those uh, Java EE technologies such as uh, Servlet or CDI uh, and so on. And many of these implementations um, have been designed from the ground up to be kind of a long running process. And the, the server themselves are designed to be able to receive and handle many requests over long periods of time. So it's sort of a conflict of interest between this kind of serverless environment where you want to be able to come up quickly, run your application, and then perhaps shut it down uh, after you're done using it. So with Open Liberty, we've, uh, when we started developing Open Liberty, we kind of had this uh, in mind to make it uh, right from the start be able to uh, be designed to run in the cloud efficiently. So it's our platform for basically running Jakarta and MicroProfile applications. But the runtime itself is highly componentized. Um, it's built upon uh, some of those technologies I mentioned that I'm involved with um, on top of Equinox and OSGI. And this allows for us to um, componentize the runtime such that it can provide a fit-for-purpose uh, runtime. And what I mean by that is you can configure Liberty to only enable the certain features that your particular application needs. So if you're just a, a simple REST application that maybe needs a little bit of uh, dependency injection with CDI, you can just enable those two features of Liberty, and then we'll only uh, load up that part of the runtime. So this lets us do a couple of things. One is um, we can shrink your container because we no longer need to pull in the full platform. We just need to pull in the bits that your particular application needs. But it also allows for us to have a faster startup time because we don't need to load up as much of the runtime to um, get your application up and running. So for a pretty simple application, just a simple REST endpoint with a little bit of CDI, we can see comparably fast startup times, um, sub-seconds uh, startup 
to get a simple application up and ready and ready to uh, take incoming requests. But as I'll go into a little bit uh, uh, more details um, later, this may not be actually fast enough for some scenarios. In particular, I'm talking about this um, scale to zero, where you want to be able to take your instances all the way down to zero instances whenever you're not, um, run, not having any traffic to your particular microservice. So this uh, diagram here is just basically an overview of something called um, K-Native. K-Native is a technology built on top of Kubernetes that uh, does auto-scaling. And part of its functionality is it does uh, have the ability to detect whenever there's uh, no traffic coming into your, your service, and it can uh, take those instances down to zero instances. Um, and then when a request comes in and it detects, oh, there's no instances running, it goes ahead and scales that up. Um, and similarly, if you get a burst of incoming requests, it can uh, continually add uh, more uh, po pods or instances of your application as needed. But the advantage of this uh, ability to go down to zero instances is whenever you don't have any traffic coming to your service, you no longer need to incur the cost of having at least you know one instance there that can always be ready to serve. Um, but when you start seeing your start, this is where it starts becoming vitally important that you can start up your applications uh, very quickly. Uh, things that start approaching a second to, to start up will start causing high latency for your users because they'll interact with it and all of a sudden they'll see this big pause and it won't be a good uh, user experience until you get enough instances up and running to, to serve them efficiently. So this kind of forces your deployments to have the set uh, minimum number of instances that they want to have available at all times, uh, even when there's no uh, traffic coming through, just so that they can be able to uh, service the requests quickly when they come in uh, later. And so this uh, is a just additional cost that you have to pay over time just to keep something up that's not really doing any work. So one approach uh, that's been taken by a few projects um, like Quarkus and Micronaut uh, and so on is to take um, your Java application and, and do a native compilation. So they use uh, the Graal VM and it has this thing called the substrate uh, compiler and it basically takes your application and all your libraries and everything that you use, and it can produce a standalone uh, executable. Uh, and this ex executable can be run without any Java installation whatsoever. It's completely self-contained. And it achieves, achieves this by using a closed world assumption. So when it's compiling your application, it, it, it needs to be able to detect absolutely everything that that application is gonna need, all of its code paths, all of the parts that it's going to do reflection on. All these things have to be uh, known ahead of time so it can compile it into the native executable. And you get some obvious gains by this approach because you can start seeing much, much faster startup times. Um, for example, Quarkus with that simple application I had mentioned, just a, a REST endpoint um, with maybe a little CDI, can start up in, in about 50 milliseconds. So, nearly instantaneous, just comes up and is ready to serve. Um, the other thing is it's an overall a smaller code size because we're able to just take away everything else that the application doesn't need, including parts of the JVM that's not using, or um, if you pull in third-party libraries, it's only going to pull in and compile in the parts that you actually use. Um, but there are some cons. Um, you, you, for applications that are maybe running for a little bit longer period of time, you're going to start seeing a little lower peak performance than you would for a long-running uh, Java instance. And that's because the JIT compiler over time can make your execution actually faster and faster, and you'll get uh, better throughput as more and more requests are coming through and exercising the code and the compiler. Uh, there's a little bit more costly memory management, and this is really just attributed to the fact that the, the Java garbage collector has been around for, you know, more than 20 years, and it's very good at what it does. And 
There is also a native garbage collector, but it just has a little bit of catching up to do. I expect that will uh, improve over time. Um, the closed world assumption may not actually apply to all of your applications. So if you're just looking to take an off the shelf application that you've been developing for years, you're likely gonna need to make some adjustments in order to make this fit into the native compilation. Um, and one of those things is like all reflection must be known ahead of time. So things like dependency injection and all this kind of stuff, they, they oftentimes use a lot of reflection. And so you need to get those kind of things configured and known at compilation times so that they can get in there. And the compilation times themselves is also can be quite long. Um, and finally, you just sort of have this difference in what you're going to be deploying uh, with the native executable versus the environment you're developing in. So oftentimes you're pulling in third party libraries and those things are going to be developed more than likely uh, on a full JVM. So you sort of have to retest to make sure that all that stuff is working properly when you natively compile it. So we're looking at an alternative approach. It's called uh, Checkpoint and Restore. So uh, it uses this project called CRIU. Uh, it's a Linux technology. So it, this is a, a Linux only solution right now. Uh, and basically what CRIU can do is take a running process and it can freeze it at a specific point in time and then save off its state. And then that state can be persisted and then read at a later time, perhaps even on another machine to restore that process right from where it was uh, checkpointed. And, and that restoration process is very quick, uh, definitely much less than 100 milliseconds, and it's gonna load that up and instantly get it uh, running again. So the idea that we have is that you can select basically a specific point in time in your server startup when it's processing your applications and getting it ready to serve, and pick a point in time to freeze it so that you can then restore from that point into many different instances. Uh, and then that restore time is gonna be vastly faster than all that work you did up to the checkpoint. So first I thought I'd go into a quick uh, demo. So this is uh, just running on uh, my local system. I have a, a build of Open Liberty that supports a uh, checkpoint. And by the way, this is also running on a build of OpenJ9 that supports Checkpoint. And then I have you know, the other dependencies you need, uh, such as CRIU installed and so on. So in Liberty, um, we have this uh, server, server uh, script that you run. And so I'm gonna run something called instant on. So this is a server configuration that just has that very simple uh, REST application that's really just a hello world uh, application. So this isn't doing any uh, checkpoint, but you'll see uh, it was just the normal startup process and it came up in about 799 milliseconds, which is actually quite fast compared to, usually I see it take about a second. But um, now this, it's just a really simple hello world endpoint, so it's using uh, JAXRS out of uh, Java EE. Um, but what we can do is we added a new uh, command called checkpoint. And then there's another parameter that where you tell it you where you want to checkpoint it at. So we have uh, a few a few different points defined where we can do the checkpoint. Uh, for this purpose, I'm gonna use something called applications. Let me just make this bigger. Um, and so that's basically the latest point that we allow for you to do a checkpoint. So what that does is this, it brings up the server and, and it's going through its startup process. But as soon as we've detected that we've started all the configured applications, but before we were opening up any ports and accepting any incoming requests, we asked the JVM, hey, checkpoint the process and save us off. And then in turn that asks CRRU, go ahead and do your, your checkpoint. That saves off the process information. And then CRIU ends up killing the actual process. So, it's, so it pauses it, saves it off, and then kills it so it's no longer actually running. 
Now if I run this uh, same server, what Liberty does is going to detect that uh, checkpointed image, the, the process image, and it's going to just resume it directly from there instead of starting the server from scratch. And so you'll notice that it, here now it came up in uh, 106 uh, milliseconds. So it's about seven times uh, faster. And a majority of that time was actually spent by CRIU doing the restoration phase. It's only the last little bit that we had to do to open up the ports and get it ready to serve. So there it is. Uh, so you can uh, bring down the server if you run it again. It should restore directly from that point again. As you see, this time it came up in uh, 71 uh, milliseconds. And so that's just a very, uh, very simple demo of, of a very simple application. Um, but, but Let's go into a little bit more details on, on what I mean by where, where to checkpoint. So that particular demo, I checkpointed at applications. So like I said, that was the last uh, point that we allow for you to do the checkpoint. Um, we have earlier points. Uh, the one in the middle there is deployment. And so that is basically where, where the servers came up and it's running and it's processed all of your application metadata, all of its annotations, any of its metadata metadata, uh, for example, if it's a war, it's going to have a, uh, it may have a web XML that needs to process. So it's processed all that stuff and it knows everything about the application, but it hasn't actually run any application code. So if your application code has early startups uh, uh, code um, in Java EE, you can have something called a servlet context listener, which gets informed whenever your servlet context for your application has been initialized by the container. Uh, those things happen after deployment. Uh, and then we have an earlier one, which is called features. And this is before we even process your, your application metadata. So it's just literally getting all the fe uh, Liberty features loaded and started but, and ready to start processing your application. And the later you do your checkpoint, the faster the restore time is going to be because you're going to have less code that you have to run before you can start serving up uh, requests. But on the other hand, the later that you do the checkpoint, the more things you need to consider for uh, when you do a restore on the process. Um, so, in, uh, so the approach we're taking with OpenJ9 and Open Liberty is we're uh, adding uh, hooks. And these hooks can get called uh, to prepare for a checkpoint. And then they get called again on the re restore side uh, when we're restoring before we continue on and start serving your application. Um, so uh, some of the things like uh, the JVM will do uh, when it's doing a preparation is it'll, um, when we're doing the checkpoint, it'll let you only do certain things with the security stack because we don't want some things to get initialized too early and then on the restore side, it, it opens those up and allows them to continue on. Similarly, Liberty has a number of uh, hooks to, that prepare uh, for the checkpoint, as well as uh, on the restore side, the hooks get called to, to let them uh, go. And I'll give some, uh, a li list a little bit, uh, some of the concerns that, that these hooks are needing to do whenever we're running like this. Uh, as of now, we're not actually letting application code take part of the, the checkpoint prepare and restore, but I do anticipate in the future, uh, if this becomes uh, more readily used by more and more applications, uh, we'll start seeing demand where applications will may want to do something to prepare for a checkpoint and then restore stuff uh, on the restore side. So here's just some examples of things that, that we need to prepare for. Um, the, one of the ones that's uh, maybe easy to understand is timers. Um, if you establish a timer in Java, one of the properties, like you can say, I want to run some, some action every five minutes, and you establish this timer. Um, 
what the timer does is it keeps track of it missed any events. So if it missed a, a couple events and didn't notify you and now it's been 10 minutes later, it's going to immediately call you twice just to get you caught up. Um, so if you're thinking about it, establishing a timer like that before you do the checkpoint uh, and then you restore, let's say, an hour later, what, what may happen is the, the JVM will come up and the timer will wake up and say, oh, an hour has passed. I need to call this, this timer all those times just to catch up. So we need help from the JVM to fix those, the, the timer implementations in the JVM. Uh, we also need to be able to do certain things in uh, the runtime, for example, the EJB container has timers as well. And the way we handle those is we just simply don't let the timers uh, became, become active until the restore side. Um, another one that really needs to be thought about is any type of connection. You really don't want to be connecting with any data sources and all that kind of stuff before checkpoint because the goal is you want to be able to restore into many instances uh, of that process from that same uh, checkpoint. So you're not going to be able to restore the same connection into 10 parallel instances. And even if you could, uh, you, you likely would not want to do that because such connections often require either some kind of authorized authentication or authentication, or at the very minimum, some configuration of the endpoint that they're connecting to. And you're not necessarily going to know that kind of information uh, at build time. Uh, you want to configure that kind of stuff at deployment time. And speaking of configuration, some of those things that, that, that can get configured in the cloud oftentimes come from environment variables or secrets. And these things aren't known and configured until you're you know, deploying your stuff to Kubernetes or your pod. Uh, and we need to be able to have those kind of configurations come through and take action at the restore side. You're not going to be able to do that in your build pipeline and have it make any sense. But once we can get through some of these uh, uh, difficulties and be able to uh, establish uh, the process getting restored very quickly. Um, we do see a lot of advantages. Um, we think it, it will be able to retain all the benefits of you know, running the full JVM on the restore side. You get full you know, dynamic loading, all the advanced JIT, uh, garbage collection. It's no longer having to deal with this closed uh, world assumption of doing native compilation. And we believe it'll enable uh, a much wider set of applications to be able to uh, participate in this checkpoint and have very fast startup time, or in this case, it'd be restore time whenever they're trying to bring their applications up quickly. Um, but there are some additional challenges. Um, we definitely want to make sure that we enable our applications that are running in a container to be able to run rootless, you know, without being the root user. Um, but CRIU itself needs a lot of elevated privileges in order to be able to take uh, that snapshot of the process and be able to restore it. And um, but we we definitely don't want the, the to require you running as root. So what we're taking advantage of is uh, the Linux capabilities. So these are able to grant CRIU certain privileges that it needs in order to uh, process, in order to take a process and do the actual checkpoint and the restore. And there was a capability that was added, uh, in fact, it was added to uh, the 5.9 kernel called CAP Checkpoint and Restore. And this was uh, in a, an attempt to reduce the overall set of capabilities that you need to sign CRIU. Prior to this, you had to assign it the, the sysadmin capability, which is a very wide range uh, of capabilities that you often want to avoid because you don't want to give that much power away. Um, and so this was added, and it was added specifically to help out CRIU. Um, it was, was backported to the 4x uh, kernels, at least uh, if you're running on Red Hat. Um, but otherwise, in order to use that, you need to be on uh, kernel 5.9 or above. But once we are able to do that, um, we can now think about how we're going to do this in a container 
and what, what it takes to actually restore the container with that uh, uh, process, uh, rest restoring that process right in that container. So I'm going to be going over how we build an, an application image in Liberty. Um, so this is a typical Docker file that you, you would see in, if you went out to Open Liberty IO and went through some of the guides, it talks about containerizing applications. So this is based, the simplest form of a Docker file. In this particular case, I have it saying Open Liberty uh, beta checkpoint. That's not actually an image that exists yet. Um, the beta one does. Uh, so that's the only difference. It would be uh, you use beta and then it do this. And, it, and then if you do the build command, um, it's going to uh, produce this demo application. Again, this uh, will not actually do anything with Checkpoint yet. That's just uh, the standard containerization of your application with Open Liberty. And if you launch that, it would start the server with your application and your configuration and be up and running. But what we're looking to do is be able to take that application uh, image and then run it uh, so that we can do a checkpoint while we're bringing that server up. So uh, here I'm just passing this in environment variable uh, WLP checkpoint and it's specifying applications. And so that's going to tell the runtime, just like I showed when I was on host, to uh, call openj9 in order to checkpoint the JVM. That produces the process image and it's now contained in uh, the running container. Once the checkpoint's done, of course, CRI kills the process, and then the container stops with that uh, saved uh, process image. But now you need to get that uh, stopped container uh, committed down into an actual image that you can now run uh, over and over. So you can do this commit command, and that takes the, the uh, checkpoint uh, a container and then commits it into this thing just called the demo. Um, one thing I neglected to mention is uh, whenever we were doing this run, I, I specified the privileged option. So that was just to avoid having to do all the uh, more scaled down kind of permissions when you're doing this um, just for brevity. But the, when you're doing this, you have to grant the container the, the amount of privilege is necessary for CRIU to work. And then when you're restoring, the restore is, is like this. And again, um, it has to specify these three different Linux uh, capabilities to let CRIU do its work. So checkpoint restore, uh, net admin is actually needed because Liberty has an, uh, a local port that it uses for server commands. And then finally, there's the sys ptrace uh, capability, and CRIU needs that in addition to the checkpoint restore uh, to do all of, it, all of the work that it needs on the process. Um, the other thing is this um, security option. It's a, it's a file that contains... Um, an additional set of system calls that CRI needs above uh, what the default is. Um, and then uh, you could specify the option unconfined, and then that just basically enables all the system calls. Uh, and then you wouldn't have to pass in this, this file that's allowing you to do just the subset that CRIU needs. And then finally, uh, we need to be able to mount this uh, in this last PID because this is what CRAU needs to, to be able to restore your process into the exact PID that it was uh, running on. And, and um, actually, in order to do this, we needed a change to uh, run C. And run C is what Podman uses to, to actually start the container. And it doesn't allow for this um, mounting of anything under proc. So we had this. Uh, pull request that, that we open uh, 3451, and that's already been merged, and it's actually in a release of run C v113. Um, if you don't do that, um, you basically have to run in a privileged container because uh, run C just won't let you do, uh, do this unless you have that, that, um, that backported. So let's go ahead and go into a container uh, 
demo. So So I have this very simple uh, script that basically does um, what I showed you earlier, where it's do it is it's going to build with the Docker file and and spit it out and then uh, run the container to do the checkpoint and then uh, commit it. So I'm going to just go ahead and run that. So you'll notice uh, up here before this uh, went off the screen, um, it was bringing the server up again. And that was whenever we were running uh, in container, the, the server configuration along with the application. And that's at the point where it, it detected, oh, I want to do a checkpoint at applications. So it did the checkpoint, stopped the server, uh, the container exited, and then it did the, the committing of that container to um, the actual image. So now to do a restore, and you probably can't see that, but it's what I had in the presentation. It's just passing in the capabilities and that security option with that file uh, that contains the extra system calls along with the mounting of NS last PID. Ah, but I still have my server running over here. So I can't bind on port 9090, 90, 80. So shut that guy down. So now it, it brought up the container. It restored the process, and it, it came up in 70 uh, milliseconds. Once we got, once Podman loaded the actual uh, image and, and started the container. Um, just to show a difference, the, there was a, a demo application that got created in that process. So this is the, the container before I did, or the image before I did that checkpoint. So it, I can start this guy as well. And in this case, it's actually starting the whole uh, server from scratch, bringing it up. And then as you can see, it was uh, nine, 946 uh, milliseconds versus the, the 70 milliseconds. Um, so if we go back, I have one last uh, thing that I want to show, and that is for uh, deploying stuff into Kubernetes with, uh, now that you built this checkpoint image uh, that, that contains that, that uh, paused process. Um, in order to deploy it to Kubernetes, you, you have to do some of the same things to get to grant uh, the capabilities and mounting of uh, NS last PID. So this is just a section of the, the YAML that's used to deploy that application to a, a Kubernetes uh, cluster. Um, so there's the security context with the three capabilities you need to add, and then um, the mounting of the uh, NS last PID. Um, again, uh, I didn't mention this before, I, I skipped over it, but there's a new system call called Clone 3, and um, that it, CRIU will use that if it's available, and that uh, eliminates this need to do this um, mounting of this in this last PID. Um, so you won't actually need that once we get the systems out there that we're deploying into how to have clone three uh, readily available. Um, I think the earlier chart said that that, that came in kernel version 5.3. So let's go ahead and just do a demo of that. So I have a local running uh, cluster on my machine, uh, Kubernetes, um, and I also have that patched version of Run C here, and then I have uh, that YAML in order to uh, go ahead and well, I'm just going to go ahead and apply that to my uh, cluster to go ahead and uh, load up that um, that container image along with the uh, 
the pause process. So that went ahead and deployed it. Um, so there's my uh, pod running. If I get the logs from it, uh, you'll see that the logs there now report that the, the server is ready to serve the application in 69 uh, milliseconds. Um, I have that particular cluster working on uh, port uh, 31,000, so that's this one. So it's up and running. If I get the logs again, um, it shows those requests that came in. Um, the final part is that I can scale this up to three replicas. So I'm just going to add two additional uh, replicas uh, of that. So it's been scaled up. If I get the, the pods, it shows that they're running. Uh, this one here came, has been running for six seconds. So it's one of the ones that got added. So yeah, so that one you know came back up in in 73 uh, milliseconds. So that is the end of my main presentation. Um, let's see. I do have a number of uh, links here. Um, so that first one is a Git repository. I, it basically has the the stuff that I'm showing with it being able to build um, that, that container. It, it lets you actually build the, uh, the support for uh, Checkpoint and Restore with the latest Open Liberty nightly build along with OpenJ9. Um, I just pointing out the, the IBM runtimes uh, link there. That's where the, the Simaru early access builds are. So that's where we're going to be publishing the, the builds that support uh, checkpoint and restore uh, from a Java perspective. And then finally, um, that last one is the open Liberty nightly builds. So those uh, contain the support for checkpoint restore. It hasn't officially gone into beta, so you have to get the, the all uh, zip that, that contains all the support. Um, so in a future time, uh, we do anticipate we'll, we'll beta this so it gets into the beta images for Liberty. So with that, I can take any questions in addition to showing you and letting you know that we think open SSF is quite important and we highly encourage everybody to go take a look at this, understand SBOMs and, and so on. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite hear the question. Oh, the three capabilities, the um, net admin checkpoint. Well, the checkpoint restore was specifically added to try and really reduce that down. Um, what was it? The net admin and the, the P trace one. I, I don't have a definite, definitive answer on how how that can take down the whole box or let it basically be open to uh, vulnerabilities, is that, or attacks? Yeah, that's what I was trying to ask. Yeah, um, that's a good point. It's something that definitely needs to be looked into and understood how, how much of a risk that is. Um, I know it's discouraged to deploy fully privileged containers just for that uh, concern. Um, so we're definitely trying to reduce down any of the privileges that are needed to try and reduce those kind of concerns. Um, the way CRIU works, I don't think we're going to be able to get that down to zero elevated capabilities, but, um, but we definitely need to have an a, a understanding of what may be at risk if you're elevating those privileges. Yeah, sorry if I misunderstood something, but um, it seems that you can run legacy application, Java application with just OpenJ9 and do restore checkpoint. 
Yeah, so OpenJ9 is adding APIs into it to checkpoint the JVM from the perspective of any uh, Java application. I was just showing you one application of Liberty utilizing those APIs and calling it a specific point of a Liberty startup process. Did you try that with other legacy Java application? Like I, Jenkins? It's a, it's a, uh, I haven't tried it with Jetty, but I have tried it. I'm, a long time Eclipse IDE developer, so I thought it'd be cool to try it with Eclipse IDE. It fell on its face because native SWT. <laughs> so I'll tell you, if you have a lot of J and I or native, uh, native code in your application, it's probably gonna be problematic. Uh, we don't in Liberty, so. <laughs> but the JVM team, so I'm part. Of, I'm primarily the Open Liberty team. The the Java team. They're obviously trying to do this generally with other applications, not just Open Liberty. Uh, first off, great presentation. Thank you for presenting. Um, my question is: Is there a way to name or version the checkpoints? So if you are running multiple different Java apps on the same host, like in Kubernetes. Um, either different types of Java apps or different versions of the same service? So the way we're viewing this is that it's part of your build pipeline when you're building your container. So you would version it and name it at that point whenever you're committing that container with the save process into the final image. So that's the point where you'd say, okay, this is application X version five and it's been checkpointed. Here's my final image. And then that checkpoint is, I guess, stored on the host with that? It's not that. stored on the host. It's actually stored in the container, that, in the image that you're going to deploy. Oh. So that was what I was trying to show with. Oh, okay. With, uh, that's what this picture is trying to show, that blue circle-y thing. That's the process image. So that's the stopped container with the process image. And then when you do the commit, you, you named it, the final name was demo. And that's the that's the image with the stopped process stored in it. And I when see. when you start that, Liberty will detect that image and restore it right from there. Very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I guess that's it. Uh, I'll be around if anybody needs uh, has additional questions. But I guess that's the end of my time.